Welcome to a special edition of Whitetail Rendezvous. What's so special? Well, I've asked six of my friends who live out here in the Rockies and are DIY archery hunters to share tips, techniques, and resources that they use to be very successful elk and mule deer hunters. One thing you got to remember, April 4th, 2017 is the closing of applications for applying for limited elk and mule deer. All the mule deer tags in Colorado are by draw only. Now, there's many areas in Colorado where you can apply for an elk or you can choose to take an over-the-counter tag. As you might imagine, there's fewer hunters in the limited draw areas, but you still can get a tag. And we have hundreds of thousands of acres of fire service land, so you can pick the place you want to hunt. Talking about picking a place, there's no better research tool than GoHunt.com Insider. And I have Brandon Evans as a guest on the show, and he's going to lead off telling you why GoHunt.com is the place to go, why Insider will give you all the information that you need to know about hunting Colorado. Why? Because I wrote many of the big game unit profiles. What does that mean? You're going to find at GoHunt.com how many preference points it takes. What's a class of trophy that's in there? Is it a 260 bull, a 300 bull, or a 350 bull? As you might imagine, a 350 bull, if it's an unlimited draw area, it's going to take a heck of a lot of preference points. It might take years, but they'll still give you the opportunity to, to use their resource tools to find a place that has 265 bulls, Pope and Young bulls, and you can get an over-the-counter tag. So Brandon Evans from GoHunt.com Insider is going to share how, why, when, and where you can be a successful DIY hunter in the state of Colorado for elk and mule deer. Oh, one thing I want you all to remember, you need to listen to the whole show to get the promo code. What's the promo code going to do? When you sign up to be a member of GoHunt.com Insider, you will be given a Sportsman Warehouse gift card. How much is that gift card? Well, you're going to have to listen to the end of the show to get that. Hey, folks, sit back, relax, and dream about hunting elk and mule deer in the Rockies, specifically in the state of Colorado, coming up this fall. Welcome to another edition of Whitetail Roundup. This is Bruce Hutchin, and we're heading out west again. Yes, this is part of the special edition of DIY Hunting the Rockies, sponsored by GoHunt.com. And we're going to meet up with Garrett Bowen. Now, Garrett is part of Top Priority Hunting, and they're a group of high-quality hunting films and stories, but really, they're no different than you and I. They're real people in real places. Garrett? Welcome to the show. Welcome, Bruce. It's uh, it's uh, nice to have you, and uh, thanks for having me on today. <laughs> so let's jump right into it. Um, top priority hunting. Really, what is its mission, and what are you going to bring to the outdoor industry? Our uh, our mission, uh, we we kept it kind of simple. Uh, as far as all four of the guys that are on uh, with TJ Hoffines, Justin Nelson, and Jeremy Stairs, and myself, uh, our overall goal, you know, in this industry that's so huge and overwhelming to most, uh, we just we really want to tell the story, you know, through our eyes and how we see it in on the hunts that we go on and just capturing you know the real life moments and the struggles and the highs and the lows and the frustrations and just producing very very top quality films uh for those people you know hunters and non-hunters to both see you know why we love what we do and why we're so passionate about you know the outdoors and what we hunt and uh each animal that we take or harvest and uh that's that's our overall goal and also you know we we are huge in on including our family uh you know wives girlfriends whatever it may be kids uh we really you know they're the next generation and they're the ones coming up and uh we really want to give them the right picture of you know what hunting is really about you know when you think of that um the shows for whitetail hunters all over North America. And the reason I'm doing the special is because the draw season's coming up. And, you know, our, um, Colorado, where I live, um, it's it 
coming up. I think it's the fourth or sixth. Anyway, you can check that at um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the exact date. But you know, I want I want people to enjoy what I've lived uh, for years and years. Uh, I've been fortunate to hunt across North America and and to whitetail hunt since uh, 1966. Uh, I know that dates me, but so what? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, thinking about that, you know, everybody spends all the money. They they get their tag in Colorado. You can get a limited access tag, or you can get over the counter for archery hunting, and that's predominantly, you know, what we're talking about here. And right. when when you think about that, talk about you know the simple things that they can do to capture their memories because you get blown away in, uh, with a sunset or a sunrise or just a, just a majestic. There's a the first bull. It's a frosty morning. You know, um, you know, just the vapors coming out of of his of his nose and he's bugling in this basin I mean it's it doesn't get any better than that for me you know it's iconic and so they want to capture that so help help them understand what's the minimum they need to do to capture that picture not only in their own mind but they can take it home and share it with their with their buddies and their crew right right yeah I mean for me and you know the group of guys that I hunt with I mean that's that's why we do it is the memories that you make you know you can go out one day and not and see something totally different from the day before so it's it's so important to us and to be able to relive you know those moments that we had like like when you were saying if you got a bull bugling in a in a basin or you know and you can just see his breath rolling off it's those are moments you you can't relive if you're not capturing and you know for us you know we're always packing cameras and uh and we have to have it out and just and rolling either you know with pictures or video and it's for me i love to take pictures so you know i can i can relive what just happened or or go back a year and and look at the past or previous hunts that i've been on and you know it's it's so exciting when you see that and you you relive it and that that's a super important thing i mean that's that's why, that's why we all hunt is we love what we do and when you capture the moments it, it just it makes it that much better what kind of gear minimum gear should they have and i mean you know um as far as as far as gear wise i mean cell phones nowadays are <laughs> they're getting to be as as good as some of the cameras that are out there uh i know they take really good pictures uh for us we run the dslr cameras so you know a little higher tech uh with with good lenses we have we run an l lens and then we're wanting to get a wide angle lens for better landscape pictures and uh but before i got on with top priority i i took heck most of my pictures were with a cell phone that was you know it had a 20 megapixel camera which is actually almost unheard of for a phone but just just taking good pictures you know of of settings sunsets uh animals if you can if you're you know if you're in close enough but just whatever whatever attracts you to being outdoors and hunting and whatever you know gets you going individually of what draws you to be out there you know capture those moments those those are what you want to relive a year or two years or in 10 years when when you're not on that hunt so it really gets us fired up and uh you know you want to go back once you relive those moments and thanks for sharing that. And, you know, I started off uh, with a waterproof uh, Canon, um, you know, just a pocket camera with a zoom lens. You mm-hmm. know, and that traveled all, all, you know, all over, the, you know, all over the, you know, the continent with me. And, you know, I just think back to the times, but on my recent sheep hunt, I took, I still had that camera with me, but I took the majority of my phones uh, with my iPhone and mm-hmm. I don't know the pixels, but, you know, I was, I was, I'll send you some photos that I took and it's just like, oh my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's, phone pictures blow me away to this day and you, you would swear it's like from a photographer that took the picture and it's it's as simple as an iPhone or an Android phone. It's it's amazing. Let's talk one second about um, um, setting up your, um, you know, uh, the film or, or, or the picture because, mm-hmm. you know, you just don't take a picture. You really, you know, there's a rule of thirds and, and right. such techniques, but just simply... Um, 
help the listeners understand what the picture is. I'm not talking about grips and grins. Um, everybody right. knows, you know, don't have the tongue out, clean up the <laughs> blood, you know, and get the background. And it, it's it's about the whole picture because pictures tell the story, and our words just confirm what they're seeing. Right. That's that's absolutely correct. And you know, everyone's different on their grips and grin photos, so that's that's a whole other topic. Uh, but as far as uh, say, for instance, landscape stuff, if you have you know a ridge line, or and you got a awesome sunset or the sun's going down or I mean coming up um, you know you want to make sure and this is the biggest thing your lighting is is what makes your picture and make sure it is in focus so whatever you're running and actually a DSLR a, any kind of Canon uh, Sony anything like that I mean just the simplest things as far as being in focus and having correct lighting it is going to set that picture and then as far as setting it up uh sunsets and stuff are pretty easy because you you kind of want to capture to put something in perspective with it so what we do is we usually kind of half and half as far as your rule of rule of thirds on that we'll put like a ridge line right in the middle and then the sunset will take up the rest of the screen so those are probably the easiest um on on other things as far as more detailed stuff say you're taking a picture you know uh, of an individual holding a bow or something you really we really emphasize on different angles um kind of unique angles something that is going to draw the eye to to what's going on um the more creative you can get with taking pictures the better they're going to turn out and it, it definitely takes a lot of time to learn and to have the eye for it and uh once you get a better feel for for how to set up a picture correctly it, it, they're going to turn out a lot better and you can you can research you know youtube this to this day is unreal Uh, get on instagram i mean there's some awesome photographers out there that in the wildlife industry that take just unreal pictures you know the word comes to me is um composition so listen you want to compose your picture you don't want to take a picture you want to compose and and the things that garrett just shared um and you can spend as much money as you want Um, i know some some birders that have more optics than i do and right you know uh, we're talking substantial substantial money why because they they love taking pictures of birds all over the world but they compose their pictures it isn't mm-hmm. just uh arctic turn and in up in um you know up in the tundra it, it's it's the whole picture and so think of that's the thing that i've learned over the years is you compose a picture and the better you compose it the better it'll tell the story yeah yeah that's i mean for us being a film crew that pictures are are crucial because that is what everybody loves to see these days i mean it because it's simple it's easy you can scroll through you can look at thousands of pictures in a day and we want to be able to grab your attention and just blow you away through what we're seeing out there when we're taking the picture say um if somebody wants to get a hold of you guys how's the best way to do that um we have uh we have our website uh top priority hunting.com and then we're also on facebook under top priority and then instagram as well all this all the same name just top priority hunting Okay, thanks for that. And a shout out to Whitetail Stalker, our social media partner uh, in the Whitetail interest industry. And remember, folks, um, we got good sound quality today, but that isn't always the case. And so remember, it's real people in real places. Whatever that means, that's what happens here. And uh, again, my friends at uh, Go Hunt, uh, Lorenzo Sartini, Sartini uh, Chris Porter, um, Brandon Evans, and Brady Miller, uh, shout out to Go Hunt for sponsoring this special segment of Whitetail Rendezvous. Now, um, let's talk about elk hunting or, or mule deer hunting, whichever way you want to go. Let's, let's, we've got about 10 minutes left. Let's spend about five minutes on elk and in, in, in the Rockies and then uh, five minutes on mule deer and talking about, okay, so you get your tag, um, you're going to hunt the Rockies. Now you're on the ground. How do you start hunting? How do you, how do you find, you know, where the elk are? 
<clears throat> so what we do, this is going to be extremely tough in five minutes and five minutes because it's such a huge topic. You can't but, do uh, it, and, and I'd I love to have you back here until this is, you know, we got to give them the 50,000 foot view, and then um, <laughs> it, what we'll do is, is we'll come back and, and um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it more in depth, and we can have a, one show and, you know, segment, right. but let's just roll what we got. Okay, so uh, the boots are on the ground, uh, never been in the Rockies or anything like that. I mean, w- what we do personally, we uh, we get to a good ridge top, uh, not necessarily the highest ridge you can find, but you know somewhere that's uh, and we do before we even hit the ground, we're we're looking at maps, you know, good waterways, uh, good feeding grounds, anything that would would draw an elk or a deer, deer kind of the same way out here but uh for us we find basins that hold water and they hold good feed because that's that's mainly where these elk are going to hang out and for it being you know say you're hunting in september the elk aren't really vocal you're going to have to get out and you're going to have to move and keep moving until you find elk and it's typically we find most of our elk you know early when the before the sun's coming up we start glassing super early and get a fix on you know where elk are kind of get them patterned where they're going to bed uh and then that we'll make a game plan from there. Um, if they are talking, you know, it's obviously a little easier, a lot easier actually, you know, to, to navigate and to work into where these elk are going to be. Um, it can be super frustrating. I mean, we've, we've definitely had highs and lows as far as finding elk. If, if you're not finding elk or seeing elk, don't waste your time in once in one area. Don't, don't hold yourself to one area. You know, there's thousands and thousands of acres, you know, get out and move and you're, you have to be willing to to pack up and hike and uh, put yourself in good situations and, and find where these elk are going or where they're going to be. So I'm, I get up at dark 30, I climb the ridge and that's a chore in itself in the, in the dark. Yes. I'm up there and you know, it, it's, it's gray light. What I like to call gray light. You can <laughs> see the, the, the sun's going to be coming up half an hour, an hour. I mean, it's just the horizons uh, lightening up and, and you got to look for elk and they, they're going to be in open places. So I see it. I see a herd. I see a bull and I know where they went to bed. Now, what do I do? Okay. So is this, are we, are we going over kind of archery topics or, or yeah, rifle? Archery. Or, or no, archery? archery. Okay. Okay. So what we do, uh, if the elk are quiet, they kind of where we hunt, I'll put that in perspective. The elk are usually out till, you know, maybe 10, 30, 11 at the latest. Cause it stays cooler in the high country. So, you know, we, we take it slow. We move in slow unless we got a hot bull and uh, we can get him fired up and, you know, get him <clears throat> to meet us halfway or something like that. But uh, we really pay attention as to what the herd size is, how many cows he has, um, how vocal he is, because that can kind of deter your setup on going in and after him. If, if he's super vocal and, and he's really pushing cows around, you can get in there and, you know, challenge him and, and kind of get him pissed off a little bit and uh you know the fight will be on then as far as you'll get him super aggressive and he'll want to come towards you to see what what's going on what's coming into his, his herd and it, it you take that and then you go to a completely quiet quiet elk that'll bugle a few times and those are the elk that are super challenging as far as if they bed down in a in a patch of timber or something you it, it's almost it's almost impossible to hunt those elk and for for people just getting into it but it i mean it can be done uh take your time go super slow on quiet elk um you know you don't have to walk down in your socks i mean elk make a lot of noise if if you're around them enough you'll you'll understand the elk are pretty loud since they're (laughs) thousand pound animals 900 pound animals you know running around they're actually, you know, when you're calling or you're going in on a setup, you know, make some noise, break some branches. As long as you keep the wind, you know, in your favor in wind, wind is your worst enemy when, when elk hunting. I mean, you have to have to keep the wind in your favor and, and definitely pay attention to your thermals as far as when the sun's coming up, 
and when it goes down, you know, write it down as far as when your thermal switch, because because if you get in there and you get within a hundred yards and you're closing on these elk, and uh, the sun's coming up, those thermals are going to change. So just it's super crucial in the in that game. <laughs> No, you mentioned um, silent bulls and and um, you know um, hot bulls, and you know it is easy to get in hot bulls, but sometimes the silent bulls are are easy to hunt because they're not running around; they're bedded up. But you mm-hmm. have to get in on top of them without right. them knowing you're there. And and the reason I bring that up is because whitetails are are just you know they're they're always on springs. They're always coiled to you know, <laughs> to blow out. I mean it's just nuts. And so the whitetail hunter, I think, and I can go back to my first uh, trips out west. I, I Dwight Chu had a good book, and I met him at the Elk Foundation. And he said, just read my book, and I did. And I was fortunate to get. Um, up close and personal to a, a spike that w- that was bedded, and I could I smelled him first. Mm-hmm. He wasn't talking at all. I was just you know north facing slopes, you know cool cool of the day, and because I was a whitetail hunter and had um, you know uh, done the spot and stalk or just still hunted uh, whitetails, I was able to get on top of them. And it wasn't to me it wasn't that much different than than still hunting you know a whitetail because you sort of kind of know they're there because you're only right. 100, 100 acres you know yeah or, or you might even be only hunting a 40 but it's the same thing so that's why i wanted to share you know if they go silent you know um talk about calf calling or mewing you know um lost calf or whatever um you know about how to get in that silent bull because sometimes that might be your best shot yeah and i and like you said about the the whitetail hunters they they have a tremendous upper hand because of the patience level uh as far as spot and stock they they're so used to those whitetails and and elk you can you can kind of get away with a actually you can get away with quite a bit more than you can with a whitetail but uh if you're if you're working in on a on a bull and uh quiet or vocal uh you know, there's certain tones and certain things that he wants to hear. And being around elk more, you're, you're going to get a better feel for what they sound like and kind of how they talk. Um, for us, we uh, we definitely mix it up as far as, you know, what that bull, what he's doing, how he's interacting with his cows, what how much the cows are talking. Um, if the cows aren't real vocal, it, it, it kind of deters you a little bit but if it's if you're in the middle of september and you know he's checking cows it 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 doesn't always mean that there's a cow in or if he's if he's looking for cows there it's it's the time so we do you know we'll we'll do some estrus cow calling uh if it's if it if the bulls are going uh a few we do quite a bit of calf calling because if there's a lot of cows around you're going to draw cows and then usually there's at least a couple bulls if not just one bull um with the cows and that kind of gets the herd wound up and that'll get that bull worked up as to you know what's going on and uh quiet bulls uh, when we work in on quiet bulls we soft cow calls uh a little bit of calf calling but but mainly just keeping it real real quiet and to a minimal what does that sound like can you uh, voice call i can't <laughs> <laughs> not as not as good as I can cow call. Yeah, but it's it's mewing. It's <laughs> right. Yeah, there, I've heard uh, I've heard some very strange sounds uh, from elk. The the estrus call. I mean, some people think it's crazy. It kind of sounds like a chimpanzee. But when there's a cow that's you know in her cycle and she's ready to be bred, she she makes the weirdest god awful sound you would possibly think an elk could make and uh that that's telling those bulls you know they're looking for a bull so that that can be a powerful weapon uh when you're after a hot bull um one quick thing talk about glunking when bulls glunking. glunk yeah uh actually when they're glunking it's it's an awesome sound uh they're they're usually right on a cow and uh you know they're either getting ready to breed her if not they already have bred her but uh glunking 
to me, when I've heard it and, and been close in on elk, it's usually been they've been right up a cow and they're following her hard and they're that that's like their sound of emotion. I would say, as far as when they're talking to that cow and, and what's going on. It kind of sounds like this. Yeah. And folks, if you ever hear that, that's an elk uh, tending a, a a cow. Okay, ten a buck tending a doe is it's similar because they will do that. Um, you know, and whitetails are really are really vocal. Well, elk are exactly the same way because elk started out east. They get they get herded out to the Rockies and they get found a sanctuary in the Rockies. But elk through the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation be reinduced way back to when Daniel Boone was hunting him in Kentucky, and they're there now. So you know they're vocal because they had to be to find each other in the timber or in the wide open plains and now uh, in the mountains. So there's some information for you about elk and, and I can't believe it, but we've already blown through our 30 <laughs> minutes. So give a shout out to your crew. Uh, let's wrap the show. I've got to have you back on because we could, you and I could go on for days. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty that easy. Stuff. And so, you know, give a shout out and then we're going to wrap the show. All right. Uh, well, our crew consists of four guys, uh, Justin Nelson being the, the main guy who put Top Priority together. He's our main editor. Uh, we he built the website, him and his wife, and uh, we have TJ Hoffines. He uh, he owns Dead On Archery, and uh, Jeremy Stairs is also a, a team member on the crew, and everybody has uh, certain jobs on the crew, and we, we kind of keep it all together, and it's it's definitely strenuous at times, but uh, we love the group, and we, we love doing uh, doing what we do as far as the filming, and uh, love showing the audience a good, a good show. So, folks, if you if you like what Garrett said, and I sure as heck have, and I'm going to have him back on, send me an email at um, whitetailrendezvous at gmail.com and say, you know, um, you know, send 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 the raves, um, you know, for top priority hunting because, you know, uh, I just love what they're doing. I love who they are, and um, you know, check them out on social media. So, on behalf of thousands of listeners across North America, um, Garrett Bowen and Top Priority Hunting. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, pardon me, top priority. Yeah, I said it right. Top priority hunting. Yeah. Um, thank you for being a guest on Whitetail Rendezvous. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. As promised, here's the good stuff. When you sign up for your membership at GoHunt.com Insider, you're going to get a promo code WR2017. Again, that promo code is WR2017. What's that going to do? Well, that's going to enable you when you pay for your membership to get a $50, yes, $50 Sportsman Warehouse gift card. So here's here's the deal. You go to www.gohunt.com forward slash insider and fill out all the information. We're going to ask for a promo code, put in WR2017. And when you get verification of your membership in the mail you will get from gohunt.com a $50 sportsman warehouse gift card couldn't be any simpler and i want to thank each and every one of you for listening to whitetail rendezvous diy in the rockies special edition Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.